Hello students, this is Dr. Winkler. I'm here trying to experiment a little bit with trying to record my lectures, place them on YouTube, so you will be able to review these at any time. As you know, this is for the Modern Civilization class. Everything I give you now will be testable on the final examination. Uh, at this point, we've been discussing, oh, by the way, uh, I hope you can see this. On the upper right-hand side of the screen is our study guide. You have all have access to this through the Canvas system at UVU. Hopefully, you've been looking at this for a lengthy period of time, so you know very easily how to get there. For your convenience, however, I have this displayed up here, so you have a pretty good idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, the idea here is that you can see me on the lower right hand side and the upper right hand side is the study guide and on the left hand side I would like to show you some illustrations from time to time. So let's proceed, move this around a little bit and let's start talking about modern imperialism. <clears throat> I'm going to argue that Modern imperialism, which is another word for colonialism, is a neg negative feature of Western civilization. When we're talking about modern imperialism, we're actually talking about what the European powers did as far as going to areas outside of Europe and establishing colonies and controlling them. This time frame largely in the areas of Asia and Africa. Uh, I'm going to argue that this is a ne negative feature of Western civilization. We see that the many countries which are involved in conquering and controlling other people, that uh, they do so in a very brutal manner. Uh, these are military conquests. They control the local people by the use of military. These people are often ex exploited. They're often forced to work. Uh, some of them are enslaved and sometimes they are treated very, very harshly. I'm not the only person who actually has this opinion. There's a man by the name of Gordon B. Hinckley. You can see his name is on the study guide. Um, I believe he's a moralist. He's a religious teacher. In any event, he gave a talk to several million of his followers on April 6, 2003. As you can see, here's a quote. We are sometimes prone to glorify the great empires of the past, such as the Ottoman Empire, the Roman and Byzantine Empires, and in more recent times, the vast British Empire. But there is a darker side to every one of them. There is a grim and tragic overlay of brutal conquest, of subjugation, of, of repression, and an astronomical cost in life and treasure. Obviously, astronomical is a very, very big word. So he's making a very strong statement here. Imperialism or colonialism is very, very old. In fact, it's part of almost every powerful civilization. We can talk about the conquest of Alexander the Great, going back to ancient Greece. We can talk about the vast Roman Empire. You start out with one city in central Italy, eventually conquers the entire Italian peninsula, eventually conquers the entire Mediterranean basin and much of Central and Western Europe. So this kind of thing's been done for a lengthy period of time. In the case of both Greece and Rome, aspects of Roman and Greek culture were taken in various areas. So one of the reasons why even in places like Spain and France today, the languages spoken there were Latin in their origin. That is, however, outside the course the, excuse me, the spectrum of this course. This is a modern civilization class, so we have to look at, at what's been happening at more recent times. Uh, the area we will be focusing largely on is sometimes what historians call the age of the new imperialism, which is roughly from 1880 to 1914. Why was it that the European countries could take over vast areas of Africa, vast areas of, of Asia at the same time. Well, there are a number of factors. They would include the ability to exploit 
economically. They would include the ability to have navies and take them long distances away. But the main mechanism by which these people can actually conquer these other peoples is military technology. We'll discuss some of this again when we discuss the First World War. But the military technology includes rapid fire artillery and perhaps, excuse me, rapid fire infantry weapons, including the, the Mauser rifle, but perhaps the most important of them all was the Maxim machine gun, which was invented by an American by the name of Hiram Maxim in 1883. Let's get a few things up here for us to look at. How about the Maxim machine gun? Which we'll be visiting in other, cat in other times as well. Uh, this is a rapid fire weapon. It will fire about 10 rounds per second against any kind of military that's not that does not equally have these kind of modern weapons, it can be absolutely devastating. So I was talking about largely in Asia and Africa. Let's take a look at Africa, for example. Uh, let's pull up about 1880, the time frame we were discussing. And we will notice, let's go to, let's see if we can get a nice pretty map here. We will notice that during this time frame, the uh, most of Africa is controlled by non-European countries. There are a few areas which are controlled by European countries. We often say maybe 10% of Africa is controlled by European countries in 1880 or 1878. We can also say that by 1914, that's a period of about 34, 36 years, that 90% of Africa is now owned by European countries. The real exceptions are Ethiopia, which is right over here, and the uh, Liberia. I had to look, took a little while to think of that. The Liberia, which is situated over here. The reason why no European country took Liberia was that Liberia was a refuge. In other words, when Americans freed their slaves or slaves were able to attain their freedom, um, some groups wanted them to be shipped out of the United States and shipped to Africa. And they set the, the colony of Liberia to accomplish that end. The other one, Ethiopia, which I've already mentioned over here, was one of the very few examples of an indigenous people that were able to exist the power of a European nation. In this case, Italy tried to take Ethiopia in the 1880s and Ethiopia defeated them. It wasn't until the 1930s when Italy came back under Mussolini and did take Ethiopia. Any event, largely in Africa and Asia, let's do a little bit of colonial Asia and give you an idea of what was going on there. Okay. Um, the areas that were largely taken this time frame were areas in, in Thailand, French Indochina, which is over here. Uh, even though China was not made a colony, it was divided up in economic spheres and spheres of influence. So we can't, really can't exclude China, China from this discussion. Um, the Philippines, of course, was taken by the United States. Um, Germany took some islands down here in the Bismarck Sea area. So we do find expansion in Asia as well. Oh, by the way, the Russians were making advances along the borders as well. Uh, Africa is the biggest land grab. It's quite spectacular, but there's something going on in Asia as well. A simple question I'm asking right here is, who did it? The simple answer is, almost everyone who can does. In other words, everybody who could did it. Uh, I mean, little places like Portugal. Portugal is not a major power at this time frame. Let's go back to our map of Africa. But Portugal tried to conquer or control 
these various areas. Belgium. Let's go to a 1914 map. Uh, Belgium. Get back here. How about that one? That's pretty good. Belgium, little teeny Belgium, took uh, this big chunk right here. We call it the Belgian Congo. Uh, Germany grabbed a few things here and there. No screen on this map. Britain did. Uh, no, I, I, I'm sorry, I have that wrong. Uh, this was Portugal. Germany was the darker green of the greenish brown here, here, and largely here. Italy, here and here. France, blue. Britain likes pink, so they're grabbing down here as well. Um, I didn't say countries including Switzerland. Switzerland can't, it's landlocked. But almost everybody who has the opportunity, who has the economic means, will in fact become involved in all of this. The United States is not immune. Particularly after the war with Spain in 1898, the United States took Puerto Rico, Guantanamo Bay, which is a on the island of Cuba. About that time they took Hawaii and they also took the Philippines. So this is simply an idea that really has arrived at this time frame. From 1881, as you can see, to about 1914, one fifth of the land area of the world was grabbed. Question we can ask ourselves is why did, they, why did the various European countries and the United States decided to do these kind of things? Uh, there are several theories. Let's take a look at some of the reasons. There was an American naval officer by the name of Alfred Thayer Mahan. Mahan, as I recall, taught at the U.S. Naval War College and uh, was a prominent author. He was a theorist as far as the importance of navies are concerned. And in the year 1890, he published a two-volume work called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. Now, look at the date, 1890. It had actually started, this enormous land grab had actually started uh, years earlier. But can we say that when Mahan's book was published, he's essentially justifying what was already going on. Of course, it's going to continue going on after he publishes the book. I've read it. It's more detail on military operations, naval operations, and I really want to uh, read for, for quite a lengthy period of time. He has an overarching thesis, and that is this, that virtually every important power in the history of the world, primarily in the history of Europe in this case, has had two things in common, has a large naval presence, and also had overseas colonies. His essential arguments are this, including going back to the Alexander the Great, whom I mentioned earlier. Alexander the Great had this great idea. He's going to leave, first after he and his father conquer Greece, then they're going to conquer the Persian Empire, which is absolutely enormous. Let's look at some of his conquests to give you an idea of what Mahan is talking about. Let's see, Alexander, I can read what I'm doing here. How about conquests? Here we got a nice map. Okay. He starts out in Greece over here, marches his army into the Anatolian Peninsula, comes down Syria and Palestine, conquers Egypt, and he goes in this vast attempt to march so very, very far across Persia, all the way to the Indus Valley, virtually all the way to India. How can Mahan argue that there's a navy involved? Well, there is to a small extent. You see, after Alexander gets going here, and even after he starts moving inland, he wants to receive supplies, and most important, reinforcements and manpower. So he's supposed to bring these people over here by sea. So there is this sea aspect to his empire. Now I'm going to start to make an argument here, that even though Mahan's ideas were very well received, quite frankly, uh, we can 
try to pin down some of his arguments and say some of these are weak. Let's look at the Roman Empire. This is a better example. As you well know, the Roman Empire is largely based on the Mediterranean. Of course the Roman Empire has very large fleets that dominate the entirety of the Mediterranean Basin. That's a huge accomplishment. Um, usually when transportation goes to the Mediterranean, to places like Gaul, which you and I know as France and Britain, most of the transportation is actually over land. But with these kind of caveats, there is quite right to say that the Roman Empire does involve a large navy and overseas conquests and colonies. Does that make them great? Well, according to Mahan, it does. Uh, more recently in Mahan's time frame, the British Empire, very large colonial empire, uh, with one flaw when the United States was able to break off starting in 1775. Then <clears throat> there was a crack in the ointment, but even before 1880, the British Empire is vast. Uh, this was an idea that, that had found a home. The influence of sea power upon history was translated in numerous languages. It was a bestseller in a few places. When it was translated into German, the Kaiser, actually the Kaiser did know English. He could have read it in the original English had he wanted to. But the Kaiser had read it a number of times, Kaiser William II. And that was one of his justifications for building this fleet, which uh, caused a lot of tension between Germany and Britain and uh, made them at each other's throats, more or less, before the beginning of the First World War. Once again, I think he has some insights. On the other hand, I think he's exaggerating. And I think a lot of nations can have power and can have influence and can feel good about themselves if, in fact, they do not have uh, large navies and overseas conquests. Well, let's look at some of the other reasons. Economic, economic. well, let's look at economic. I, everybody wants to make more money. There's no doubt about that. Uh, will colonies give you more money. Well, the theory is you can go down and you can grab the natural resources of Asia and Africa. And uh, you can grab the natural resources. Uh, yeah, you can find uh, large amounts of gold in places down in Rhodesia. Uh, there's chrome that you can find in various places as well. Uh, Africa is rich in resources, so you can get them down there. My argument would be, well, why do you have to conquer and kill people to get the resources? Why can't you just trade for them? But it's more national prestige involved if you can grab them. Can you create markets down there for your products? Sure you can. Europe is becoming industrialized. They want a bigger market share. They want to be able to sell their goods and services abroad. On the other hand, you have to conquer people to force markets upon them. If you've got a good product, why won't it sell? Markets, trade. There's an irony here, because in reality, the ideas of Adam Smith of free markets are strong in most of these countries. But when the various countries conquer these various areas, they do not allow trade very often with other nations. Can we say rather than arguing for free trade, colonies have a tendency to restrict markets and restrict trade. In these cases, almost all of these arguments leave a lot to be desired. Quite frankly, they're fallacious. In almost every instance of all these colonies, it costs more to conquer and administer the colonies than they brought in from added wealth. You can imagine how much it would cost in a large navy and a military force, sometimes many thousands of miles away, to march in and to conquer people. When you did this, then you've got to administer these people. You've got to send other military forces down there. Uh, that's very expensive. One of the very few examples of a colony being able to pay for itself was India. India actually brought in more money uh, to the British Empire than actually it cost to administer it. On the other hand, we will look at that in a little while to see what the cost was in human terms. But in almost every other case, Colonies were a financial drain. Prestige, well, of course. My goodness, you want to feel good about yourself, don't you? 
I mean, let's say you're a, a little French girl or French boy living anywhere in France, and you pull out a map of Africa. Oh, look at this, it's blue. Wow, that's France. France national color is blue. Wow, you can look at all this. Wow, oh, goodness, the, the flag of France and the French Foreign Legion are down here pushing people around and shooting Arabs, doing some pretty awful things, actually, but you're so much, you have so much pride in all of these large areas that your nation controls. Now, of course, you know a lot of this is rocks and sand. It's not terribly valuable, but it looks good on a map. The vast British Empire. The British Empire is absolutely huge. The largest of any of these colonial states. It encompasses between one-fifth and one-quarter of the entire land mass of the world, probably between one-fifth and one-quarter of the entire population of the world is under control of a small island in the North Sea, which we call Britain. Once again, look at the map. Whoa! Look at all this that's owned by Britain. National prestige, sure. One of the reasons why Germany gets involved grabbing these areas that at least initially nobody wanted was to say, well, now we have a nice place to flat to plant the German flag. So prestige, security, okay. Will you be able to better defend yourself and your interests if you have outposts here? There are a few choke points in the world. Let's go to Asia. There are a few choke points. Right down here on the, off the coast of Malaysia is the city of Singapore. It's an island. Any traffic going through here could be controlled or watched by the British Navy because the British own Singapore. Uh, that is of some, some interest to them. Can we say this is a matter of security? We can. They can certainly fight with pirates, but you have to establish a large colonial empire to have a military presence, to have a naval presence, to control the area. And quite frankly, you don't have to have this. Um, once again, I'm going to say the security argument, therefore, is weak. You don't have to go to the extent you want to, uh, to just make sure that the markets and the trade routes are protected. Missions, well, you want to, you want to convert people. A lot of Christians say, here we are Christians, we're living in Europe. We have this really, really great, large, wonderful religion. And now we want to get people to take it in. Well, if it's such a wonderful religion, why do you have to bring a military presence in and a, and a colonial administration to get people to accept your message? Um, if your message is so good, you probably don't need to do this. But a lot of people do argue, we are doing these things to the good of these people, because Christianity is superior to uh, these other religions which other people have. Well, unfortunately, the people there might think of something different. There is a uh, very embarrass embarrass embarrassing aspect to some of these things. And let's look at French, if I can get this up right, French Indochina. Okay. And uh, French Indochina, as you know, is in Southeast Asia. Well, one of the ways that the French decided to try to control Southeast Asia was to bring in as many people as you can as far as into Christianity is concerned. Let's, let's bring, make them Catholics. Therefore, the idea that Catholics will be more inclined to agree with the French rather than the local people who are largely Buddhist. Well, there was a, a few times when France was dominating French Indochina where the Christian missionaries were sent in, but they didn't do so well. And quite frankly, at times they were said, we don't like you, we want you to get out of town, we can push them out. And then French gunboats uh, showed up in the Mekong River Delta and up in this area. That's relatively embarrassing. Uh, under French guns, the missionaries were able to return and uh, faced a lot less harassment. Some historians have said this is an example, one most recent example, of forced conversions coming from Christian states into others. I want to say this probably not forced conversions, but can we say that with artillery nearby and French gunboats nearby, that uh, people will be uh, more tolerant and maybe listen a little bit more carefully to the, to the Christian message. So missions, I think, is once again a weak argument. Nationalism, that goes back a little bit to prestige, doesn't it? 
nationalism. We feel good about our nation. We're French. Everybody in the world should be French. Uh, we're British. We're, we're Belgian. Uh, everybody needs to be feel proud about their nation. Uh, another weak area is humanitarianism. We're there for the good of the people. We're there to help them understand the economy better. We help them. We're there to help them do a better job in feeding their people. One of the unfortunate, very unfortunate occurrences that took place during the colonial period, let's go over Africa again, was that during the 1880s, there was a series of droughts. The Sahel, as you know, which is the area largely in this area of Africa, the Sahara deserts, the deserts are up here, but the Sahel is largely between, is grasslands largely between the deserts and or equatorial areas where you have more trees. A lot of people live here, they have herds and they have farms. When you have a major drought, unfortunately Africa has been subject to a number of droughts over the years. When you have a major drought, this can be disastrous because people cannot grow their crops. And a lot of times they don't have adequate food for their animals. What would have happened had the European powers not been involved is unclear. But because they were involved, the normal trade patterns had been disrupted by military use, by also the creation of boundaries and borders here, which probably inhibited food resources that was available, or were available, I should say, from being able to get to the right place at the right time. If that's true, and I think it is, the colonial powers made a situation, a bad situation, worse because of their interference. Um, are they really doing these people, people uh, a lot of favors? Less, as we look at India in just a little while, I will, make, I will make a little bit stronger argument that they're doing these people no favors at all. Peace, here's the one that really sticks me in the craw. We're conquering people in the name of peace. We're killing people in the name of peace. We are bringing our rapid fire artillery, we're bringing our machine guns to mow people down in the name of peace. The idea, or the argument being, is this. Uh, yeah, people have squabbles. There are wars going on. Sometimes these wars have been going on for a very lengthy period of time. And now we come in and now we establish peace. Well, we, really. Uh, if people rebel, well, they just don't see the brilliance of our government. So we kill them. If you want to bring in peace, you don't do it with a machine gun. If you want to bring in peace, you might want to help people find conditions of peace rather than to force them into your government. Of course, sometimes the colonies don't get along with other colonies, but can be quite damaging as well. Let me tell you a little bit of a personal story. When I was a kid, my mother tried to get, get me interested in poetry. Good old mom. She's a nice lady. And... Uh, she had a book called 101 Best Poems. And she, for whatever reason, mom seemed to like Rudyard Kipling. And one of these poems, I think there was two in this book by Rudyard Kipling. One of them was called The White Man's Burden. Um, Kipling, when I was a kid, was still thought of somewhat highly, in other words, they foisted him upon us. I think these were called just so stories. He wrote a number of stories about how leopards got their spots, some things that small children might be amused with, and I think I was amused. Um, he's written a number of important poems, but uh, he was also a propagandist for the British Empire. He was born and raised in India, thought very highly of the British Empire, and uh, wanted to see it perpetuated. As you know from your American history in 1898, the United States conquered the Philippines. We took the Philippines from Spain. And in doing so, we established our colonial empire, which was there until we finally gave the Philippines independence in 1947. So we we're there for what, close to 50 years. Kipling wrote this poem, I believe 1899, as a dedication to what the United States was doing. Quite frankly, it's also a dedication to the very idea of colonialism. It's called The White Man's Burden. This is not the entire poem. You can easily look it up. 
but let me quote a few lines from it. Take up the white man's burden. The white man's burden is this. The white man's burden is you going into these countries and you, you're taking this upon yourself, th th this moral statement to do something good for these people, to make things better for these people, to make them more civilized, to make them more peaceful, to make them more Christian. It's not like we're abusing these people. We're taking upon this as a moral crusade. Let me go back to the poem. Take up the white man's burden. Send forth the best ye breed. Really, the best ye breed. The best ye breed, the best people in your countries are home. They have money, they have resources, they have education. They're certainly not going to go out in some place where you get malaria, some place where you can suffer and die. No, this is not the best you have in your society. These are the dregs. These are the guys who can't do anything else. Send forth the best ye breed, no way. Go bind your sons to exile to serve to serve your captive's need. Really? We're not there for their good. I don't care what he says. We're not there for their good. To wait in, he in heavenly harness on fluttered folk and wild. Because these people are wild folks. Your new-caught sullen peoples, half devil and half child. Half devil and half child. Could there be a more vicious insult to humanity than to call a human being a devil? Or to call an adult a child? This is a vicious insult. These people aren't devils. These people are intelligent. They're able. They have their own cultures. Just because they're different doesn't mean they're evil. Take out the white man's burden in patience to abide. Yeah, we're showing patience, right? To veil the threat of of, let me read it right, terror and check the show of pride. Yeah, we're not doing this as a matter of pride. Of course we are. That's exactly what we're doing. By open speech and simple and hundred times made plain to seek another's profit. No way. I'm sorry. It's, it's a bald-faced lie. To seek another's profits and work another's gain. We're not doing this for them. We're doing it for us. Take up the white man's burden. The savage wars of peace. You've already heard my opinion on killing a man to make peace. Fill the mouths of famine. Actually, it's making it worse, not better. And bid the sickness cease. This is so putrid, I cannot stand it. I never got good at poetry. I'll read it. When I was a kid, I couldn't see what was being said here. This is total garbage. Part of the justification for what these people were doing is called racism, used to justify colonies and to justify killing human beings. After all, we are, as white people, we're, we're genetically superior, aren't we? We don't know anything about genes yet, but we are, by our nature, we are, we are better. Um, there's been a very lengthy period of time where people in societies think they're superior to people in other societies. It's called ethnocentrism. I have a tendency to think that American society is a good society. Why? Because I'm American. Ethnocentrism. That's not unusual. But by the time we get to the 19th century science, remember we talked about the scientific revolution. Science has made a big change. Science has made, made a, big, a big difference in how people view the world. Science brings prestige. If you can make a scientific argument, it has more prestige than many other ways of making arguments. Um, in a British naturalist by the name of Charles Darwin, everybody knows Charles Darwin, he published a book in 1859 called The Origin of Species. I could give you a test right now and ask you to explain the basic theories of Charles Darwin. And each one of you would probably get 110% on examination because you probably know 10% more about it than I do. However, his theories are perhaps the most well-known of all theories, of all scientific theories. What is he arguing? You all know this. One of the great questions the naturalists were asking is why are there so many plants and animals? The numbers are huge. Where do they come from? How do we explain them? 
The basic argument in Darwin's Origin of Species is this. It is selective breeding. In other words, that which is by nature superior will dominate. If you have a plant living in the jungle and there is a, an advantage for that plant to be taller, maybe it gets closer to the sunlight, can, uh, can uh, uh, get more bugs to move around in it, to move around its sap, then it will survive better than something that's small. This is natural selection. An animal um, can run faster to get away from the predators, will have a chance to survive, or a better chance. The animals that are slower, in this case, won't, won't survive. This is natural selection. It is the natural order of the universe that some plants and animals are superior to others, and that's why they survive. Some people have argued that well, Darwin, this very clever man, did not argue about human evolution. That is a little bit misleading. If we read The Origin of Species, he's not talking about human beings, but obviously, if we consider human beings as being biological entities, clearly we would fit within that category. Then there's The Descent of Man, which he published in 1871. He doesn't argue quite as strongly in this case, but uh, his case is, is clear. He does believe that human beings are involved in this biological process and that human beings did evolve from different species going on back millions of years. Well, okay, so people are here because we, we adapted back. Then there's the other question of this. This is what we call social Darwinism. How about various groups of people? Brown people, black people, white people. And um, let's say that some of those are superior to others. This is social Darwinism, where you say that if you happen to be Japanese, you are superior to Chinese. If you happen to be European, you're superior to people in Asia. Because you're white, you, have, uh, you say that you're superior to other people in Africa because they're black. This is social Darwinism. We take Darwin's theories and use them on human populations, human populations that exist today. And Darwin's ideas, therefore, are perverted to support racism. An irony, if you will, about social Darwinism is that Darwin didn't believe it. Darwin himself believed that there is one human race. We're all the same. But other people took his ideas and perverted them. Well, let's look a little bit closer at social Darwinism. The idea is that by their nature, some human beings are superior to others. There has been an awful lot of effort. And I will call them bigots. And there are bigots in science. There are bigots in social aspects. There are bigots in religion. They've been trying to prove to everyone's satisfaction that white people are superior to everybody else. That is even close to true. I mean, if what they were saying were true, then why on earth would there be an inferior form of human beings around? Because we had already become superior. Of course, their argument is that there are inferior people because the entire process is not yet complete. To complete them, we have the right. We have the right by our nature to dominate other people because they are inherently inferior. There's nothing they can do about it. If this were true, and we were not one, species, one race, if you will, then how could we possibly inter intermarry with each other? I mean, people have been traveling around the world for a long time. For hundreds of years, people have been going thousands of miles. There's no problem with intermarriage. When the conquistadors come to the Americas, they have no problem intermarrying with the Indians. Go down to Latin America and see what you have there. A lot, a lot of people. Um, already people have been going down to Asia for a long time. There's no problem. No problem. The children are just as intelligent, able, fertile as anybody else. If we were different species, that would not be the case. Comparison might be 
uh, when we talk about mules. A mule, as you know, is a crossbreed of a horse and a donkey. They are far enough apart that you can't have a mule, but a mule is sterile. A mule does have some similarities to both animals, but a mule cannot replicate itself. Many years ago, there was an animal in uh, the Hogo Zoo in Salt Lake City. It was called the Liger. It's supposed to be a cross between a lion and a tiger. I think its name was Shasta. I don't know how on earth they pulled this off to get a lion and a tiger uh, to go out with each other and start dating. But anyway, they, they produced this, this animal. He was quite famous. He used to show up in his uh, in the newspapers every now and again until he died. I should say it died because it was sterile. Lions and tigers are so far enough apart that if you can have an animal come from them, it cannot replicate itself. Human beings are all the same. We are all the same. We interbreed very, very easily. And there's no problem with that at all. But I still haven't addressed the question. Why is it that we have certain people that are arguing that there are some inferior and superior human groups? Okay, aside from the fact that you can intermarry, aside from the fact that you can interbreed very easily. Well, um, if that were true, way, I'm way off here. If that were true, then you could take a little girl from England and you would take her and take her down to Africa. And you would take this little girl to Africa and immediately once you set her down there, she would create parliamentary democracy and start wearing a corset. That's ridiculous. She would act and think just exactly like the people down there. Conversely, if you took a little black girl from the Congo or wherever in Sub-Saharan Africa and brought her to Britain, she would not start wearing a grass skirt and she would not live in a hut. She would speak perfect English, she'd be very good at school, and she would show all the proclivities of having been raised in, as an English girl in English society. Some people say there's a difference in intelligence. There's no way to prove that. Quite frankly, the evidence indicates something completely opposite. There was an American doctor, American physician, in the morning. And uh, he decided that human beings are superior on the basis of intellect. And the way you can measure intellect is by the size of the brain. The theory being a bigger brain is a, is a smarter person, just more there. Uh, that's completely fallacious. I mean, I have a large hat size. Does that mean I'm more intelligent than you are? I don't believe that's the case at all. Can we say if there is an intelligence within your brain, it's not the size, it's how it's wired? I don't know Albert Einstein's hat size, but it wasn't large. And he did some pretty brilliant things with, with his brain. Nonetheless, because let's go back to this man's arguments, his physician. So he went around collecting, oh, I read one book, I think said 4,000 skulls, another said 6,000. In any event, he went around to various places throughout the world and trying to gather human skulls. And in doing so, he had African skulls and he had European skulls and actually different nationalities within Europe, like Germans and Brit and Englishmen as well. And uh, he tried to measure the internal cranium, the brain capacity of all of them. And he started out with, oh, what was it? It was flaxseed. He dumped the flaxseed in there. Well, one of the problems with flaxseed is that it is somewhat compressible. So you could, if you wanted to, you could shove your finger in a little bit more and you could find a little bit of room for it. Later on, he started using lead shot, and lead shot is not compressible. So he took the skulls and he measured them. He dumped in the lead shot, see how much it took to fill up the brain the brain cavity of the skull, and then he would dump it out and see how much you had. According to his measurements, the people with the greatest brain capacity, in other words, the most intelligent people anywhere in the world, are in fact Englishmen and Germans. Now, this is actually quite convenient, because if you look at white people in the United States, 
the largest group of people in the United States are in fact uh, have German ancestry. The second is have English ancestry. What Morton actually had demonstrated was this, that white Americans are the most superior people in the world because they come from German and English stock. When he measured the internal capacity, the brain capacity of Africans and American Indians, he found that they were smaller. One of the ways, one of the numerous fallacies in how he did this is he didn't take account of age. If you have an African child, of course, he's going to have the biggest brain as an African adult. So there are flaws. However, he was a fraud. One of the most remarkable things about his stupidity is this. He was not a conscious fraud. Usually a conscious fraud will do this. A conscious fraud will destroy the evidence. So you, so you can't see what they did wrong. He didn't destroy the evidence. He, he, he left the brains. When I took freshman anthropology all oh, 50 years ago, they were still telling us that white people have bigger brains than Africans. That's a bald-faced lie. That's not true at all. You see, what happened is they took these uh, skulls more recently. They took the skulls and remeasured them. And rather than saying that, that a white man has five more cubic inches of brain capacity than an African, they found out there's no difference. This American physician had even fooled himself. He had taken his bigotry and trying to prove that white people are superior and measure the data in such a matter as it would come out the way he wanted it to. There has never been a compelling study, those who had many attempts, to indicate that people of different ethnic groups have different aptitudes for intelligence and culture. IQ tests were very popular a hundred years ago. In fact, when I was in junior high school, I took an IQ test. They're trying to measure our ability to go on and our ability to learn and take certain classes. And in reality, they throw them out. And I don't think they, people give these IQ tests anymore. Some of the early IQ tests in, would include like uh, something like um, <laughs> um, Tony the Tiger advertises what cereal? Well, Sugar Frosted Flakes. Everybody in New York City would know that, at least in my generation. Would anybody on the uh, reservation in New Mexico know that? No. You see, they why, if they're measuring anything, and I'm not sure they're measuring anything properly, IQ tests do have a tendency to measure acculturation. And people of different subcultures are, in effect, going to respond differently. I would think if Indians on the reservation had written the IQ tests, people in New York would not do very well. It's all a bunch of bigotry. All human communities are the same. You give everybody the same opportunities and we will accomplish the same. Let's, we'll come back to this when we talk about the Nazis. Because when we talk about the destruction of the Jews during the Holocaust, the Nazis are going to use these same ideas that are going to say that human beings are inferior, case of Jews, gypsies, and others. They do not even deserve to live. Okay. Let's point out another point. Here's an irony involved in the colonial empire. An irony is the advancement of human rights at home. The 19th century is actually a very exciting time. In almost every place in Europe, more and more men. Unfortunately, women aren't really at it until the 20th century. But at least as far as men are concerned, more and more men are given the right to vote. More and more men can actually have a say in their governments. This is true of Britain, this is true of Germany, this is true of France. So human rights develop at home. But this is not the same kind of things that they're able to push abroad. In fact, the same countries that are giving rights at home are presenting repressions abroad. 
Let's look at a few specific cases now. Let's look at colonial Africa. Can we say one of the most spectacular land grabs in history? So I've already mentioned, I'm repeating myself, let's go with it. In 1870, about 10% of Africa was owned by Europeans. By 1914, 90% was owned by Europeans. Now let me give you an example. There is the king of the Belgians, his name was Leopold II. And, you know, he's a little bitty country, doesn't really matter. He's sandwiched between Germany and France. Oh, my goodness. He's, it's industrialized. His people are wealthy. But it's just so small. We need something better. How about a colony? Make him feel better. We'll create a colony in Africa, which later becomes the Congo. There was a man by the name of Morton Stanley. Morton Stanley was something of an adventure. He was a, uh, goodness, he was raised in an orphanage in Britain where he was sexually abused as a small child. He migrated to the United States. He first fought for the Confederacy in the Civil War. After he was captured by the Union, he started fighting for the Union. I'm not sure how many men could say they fought on both sides of the Civil War, but he was clearly one of them. To make a name for himself, he did some explorations in Africa. He, a man, a missionary by the name of Dr. Livingston, had disappeared in Africa. Stanley came down to him. The most famous quote we get from Stanley is, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Well, there was a mystery in Africa. There was a river called the Congo, which came out right here and went into the Atlantic Ocean. The, the explorer, explorers in the interior saw, so let's get a Congo River up here. So the headwaters, there's these rivers. Okay, I need a map. Maybe that will work. How about that one? Okay, that one might even be better. There's a number of tributaries up here. Um, explorers knew about the tributaries, and they knew, and of course, people knew about this river going into uh, the Atlantic Ocean, or the same river. So Stanley, in one of his great adventures, decided that he was going to follow the rivers, the headwaters here, all the way to the sea to prove they were, they were one in the same rivers. Uh, in doing so, he decided to go down. He didn't want to have any trouble with the people. Got these boats, of course. He brought his high-powered rifles with him. And uh, to show who was superior, he would you know, kill a few people. Just murder them. This is very, very small compared to what happened a little bit later. Nonetheless, he had traced this down here. When Leopold II found out about Stanley, he paid Stanley to go back, let's do some more explorations in the name of Belgium, so Belgium could name a, could claim some of this area. So um, they, they, the colony of the Belgian Congo was created. Well, it's expensive, it's a long way from Belgium. Uh, we need to find a way to get it to pay for itself. It doesn't really work, but at least get pay for some of it. Well, what can we do? How about mine the resources there? Before plastics became available in the 20th century, a decorative and useful product actually was ivory. The best place to get ivory for, was from elephant tusks. Uh, hunters would go and there were vast elephant herds down there at this time. They'd kill an elephant, take the tusks off. And the ivory could be carved down, used for decorations. Actually, before the use of plastics, they used it for billiard balls. Uh, they were a valuable product. Well. The African elephant is not dumb. Of course, you start killing them within reach of the, of the colonial holdings of the Belgians over here. And the animals here are gone. And then in their migrations, the other animals are actually outside of the colony. And they've, they've gone down quite dramatically in numbers. Well, okay. So for a while, ivory was a big deal. Then after a while, they, they were not, didn't have the opportunity to exploit the ivory. So the next thing they decided to do was look in another direction. And uh, it was it Miles Goodyear that vulcanized rubber? In doing so, he made rubber a valuable, a valuable commodity. 
you could use galoshes. I don't think people use this anymore, but when I was a kid, you still had galoshes. They were made out of rubber. You'd put them over your shoes, you'd buckle them, and that way when you went walking in the snow or the rain or the water, it wouldn't get your shoes wet. Uh, something else was very important this time frame was the invention of the pneumatic tire. The pneumatic tire is actually what you and I are very familiar with because on your car, that's what you have is pneumatic tires. In other words, you have rubber and you have air pumped into the tire. And if the air and the rubber there, when it hits a bump, it absorbs the bump quite better. Automobiles hadn't been invented yet, but wagons using pneumatic tire made the made traveling a lot more comfortable and a lot less damaging to your products that happen to be in your wagons. So where do you get this? Well, you can get this from rubber tree plants, and there's going to be a big problem with that when the French start growing rubber trees in French Indochina, because they're going to do so in a very brutal manner, literally working people to death, because what you want is rubber, right? But it takes a long time to grow a tree. In the meantime, where are you going to get rubber? There is a parasite plant that lives in the Congo Basin. It is a vine, and it lives on trees, it grows up trees. And from it, you can get latex. In other words, you can come in, you can take a big whack, use your knife or your axe, and cut this vine, and use a cup or some kind of bucket or holder to fill up and then you have so many liters of latex. The latex can be used to make rubber. So now you've got another opportunity to bring in a commodity you can get from the Congo. Well, how do you go about getting it? You hire local people, you get them to carry guns, and then you go out and go to the villages. There's villages all over the place. It's very heavily, heavily occupied by human beings. You simply take the villages and you order the people to go out and bring in so many liters of this latex so they can run out and cut the vines and get the latex. You don't pay them. This is simply done by coercion. Obviously, if you paid them, it would cost you more money and you want to get it for free. You get it free by brutality. Sometimes you hold the village hostage. You go out and you grab the village. And then you order them, we will kill your husband, we will kill your wife, we will kill your children, unless you bring in so many hundreds of uh, receptacles full of uh, liters of latex. Uh, let's be hypothetical here. Let, let's say you end up with, uh, you, you demand these people, go out and bring you 100 liters of latex. So these people go out, and uh, if they bring back 100 deaths, it's fine. Well, what if they bring in 90 or 80 or even 70? Uh, you, you see, you can't let these kind of things start happening. Because when things like this start happening, maybe you're getting less than what you, what you bargained for. So unless you have the entire 100 liters of this latex, you start killing people in the village. You're not laying them out. To make a statement, sometimes you wipe out the entire village. See, people have to learn that they will actually do what they are told, no matter what. The uh, men that did the forcing were under the command of the, of the Belgians, but, local, but most of them were, were local people, in hired guns, people that you could hire as mercenaries to go out and kill other people. You had to be very, very careful when you give these people weapons. What if the weapons actually were used against you? They maybe decide they didn't like you and there might be a revolt or some problem like this. Count the ammunition. The guns aren't going to hurt people if you don't have ammunition. The only way you get ammunition is from the Europeans. So they would take the Europeans, take the ammunition, excuse me, and give it to these, these men with rifles. And if you, the only way you could use the rifle was to the round in the rifle was to kill a human being. Anything else was unacceptable. Well, what if you're out, out and you want a little monkey meat for dinner or something? So you shoot a monkey. Well, then you have to have proof that you kill a human being. Uh, more difficult scenario is what if you tripped and dropped the, uh, some of the ammunition into the river or in the mud, you couldn't find it. But for each missing round, 
you have to bring in proof that you killed a human being. One of the ways you do this, of course, you could cut people's heads off. That would prove it, wouldn't it? Well, heads are heavy and they're messy and they blood and guts running out all over. Let's do something simpler. Let's just simply say that every time you kill a human being, you have to bring in a hand, a human hand, to prove that you have actually killed a human being. So this is what you see all over the Congo. You take people because you had to have a hand and you cut their hands off. Here's a man holding a hand. This man's holding apparently two hands. Here's a man up here with no hands. I cannot tell you how disturbing I find these things to be. To kill human beings in the name of peace. To cut people's hands off for expect exploitation. They had a severe whip. It was called the shakot. It was made of rhinoceros hide. As Americans, we're all familiar with bull whips, are we not? Bull whip, as you know, is made of leather. Uh, the shakal was actually a more vicious thing. A bulk whip was actually made to sound uh, loud. It would crack when you try to get your oxen and your horses to move. Uh, the shakal was made to damage human beings. And this is one of the means of coercion, was to whip people with the shakal. It could damage them, it could kill them, but it was very, very painful. I, I read an account by uh, an, a European who was down in the Congo, and when he's villages, towns have been created by the Europeans. And uh, there's one night he was in his room, he's trying to sleep. He kept on hearing this rap and a scream and a scream. Well, he, he didn't investigate the entire day, entire night, but he didn't sleep well. So the next day he came outside and walked around and decided that he wanted to find out what had happened. And he went outside and he was told that there was a child that had laughed in the presence of a white man. The child didn't laugh at the white man, but in laughing in the presence of the white man, the black child had not shown proper respect. And on the basis of that, not only that child had to be punished, but all the other children had to be punished as well. So all of them were whipped to show that they would not make light of white people. How vicious is this? Sometimes they kill people just for the fun of it. There was a boat going up the Congo. A couple of white guys were on. They looked at a man in a, in a, in a dugout canoe uh, a certain distance away. And the white man said, Bitch, you can't hit him. I guess, oh, sure, I can. Easy shot. So he took out his high power rifle and shot. He missed. Of course, the man in the boat realized he was being shot at and tried to escape. Rode as fast as he could, trying to get away. Finally, the other guy says, you can't even hit that. He took dead aid and killed him. He killed them because he could. He killed them because it was funny. These men came down. If you are having trouble dating women in Belgium, you can go down to yourself all the women you want. A harem, 10, 20 women. Lock them up, make them serve your sexual needs. Slavery was illegal, but not in the colonies. You need make work. I'm jumping ahead of myself here. You need to build a lot of infrastructure. The boats on the Congo, you'd have to have a little wharf to put them in. A big make-work project was a railroad. Let's go back to a map of Africa, if I can still find it. The map of Africa. Let's go back to Congo. I'll find it. Let's get rid of Alexander. We don't need them for a while. And we'll go back to the Congo. 
one of the problems in exploiting the interior of Africa is there's a fall line. It's, a, it's down along here. So it's easy to move around the rivers up here. Of course, you have to fight currents. But when you get right here, the water falls off and it goes down into the Atlantic. You've got to figure out a way of getting goods and services up and down the river. Get past the fall line. The way the Europeans, the Belgians decided to do this is they're going to build a railroad that goes around the fall line so they can have access up here. So you have to have labor. You could hire people. They're not going to do that. You simply enslave people. You force people. You literally chain people and you work them to death. I remember reading an account by a, by a woman who, uh, whose village was attacked because some white people wanted to have free labor. And what they did was this. They came into the village. Nobody wants to be saddled by small children and babies. So the first thing they did was kill the babies. Maybe it would have been merciful if you had to just shot them or ran them through with a sword. But what they did is they took the babies and they threw them out in, out in, the, out in the grass of the weeds. The child had no chance of survival. Sometimes it would take days for it to die. Sometimes it would be killed by wild animals. So this woman lost her ch children. And they were marching her and the other members of the, fa of the village to do this work. Her husband could not keep up. When he fell down, the other men got around him, having bayonets on the rifles, and kept prodding him with the bayonets. The last time she saw him was when he was trying to get up and they were sticking with bayonets. Of course, they killed him. The death toll on this railroad was huge. Thousands of villagers, thousands of men died to build that railroad. When someone died in these make-work projects, they just let the bodies rot. A lot of times they didn't even bother to take the chains off of their bodies. So they just dumped them for years until these bodies completely decomposed. People on the railroad going up and back along this area saw the evidence, saw the corpses laying and rotting away. We do not know the number of people that were in the Congo when, when uh, Stanley first explored it. A rough estimate would be maybe 20 million people. This is very heavily occupied area. Within a couple of decades, after the Belgians had moved in, we believe the population declined to about 10 million. This is a loss of half the population. This is a loss of 20 million people. Many of them were worked to death. Many of them were killed. Maybe some of these people just decided they wouldn't have children because they didn't want to watch their children die. All of these factors can, could come easily come into play. When Stanley came down the rivers, he saw villages everywhere, highly populated areas. A couple of decades later, when people were going up and down the river, they almost saw nothing. There were no villages. People had disappeared in the interior. If they saw anybody at all, they were running away because to see a European was, in fact, a possibility you would be killed. I don't want to tell you that this was an isolated instance. The French Congo, which is largely over here, did the same kinds of things. Now, I haven't found a book to read on that, so my knowledge is somewhat limited. Let me go back and talk about somebody else, however. Let's talk about Joseph Conrad. Joseph Conrad was a Pole. He's from Poland. And he was a, he was a ship's captain. Uh, when I was in high school, they had us read some of his stories. And one of the things that was absolutely brilliant about him was his extremely good ability to, to describe issues, describe scenery, describe boats. This is absolutely remarkable because he didn't really start learning English until he was like 29. He was not a young man anymore. Polish and English are very different languages, grammar and structure. So he's something of a literary and a literary, literary and linguistic genius. He liked, he was a ship's captain. He liked to become involved in stories about the sea. 
In his diary, he tells about taking a boat up the Congo. His diary is one of those where he, he describes seeing dead bodies on the side. However, he wrote a novel in 1902 called Heart of Darkness. Heart of Darkness is about, it's fictional, but the setting is quite real. It bothered Conrad so much of what he saw that in reality, he wanted to leave a, a record which people might read. In Heart of Darkness, he talks about exploitation, he talks about murder. He talks about how, how uh, the people were badly treated. The difficulty in writing a book of fiction to tell a factual story is that too often people reading the fiction think it's a fabrication. Well, the action and characters are fabrications. But the story, very unfortunately, is true. Let's look at a couple other examples while we are discussing the, uh, the impact of the colonies on the continent of the peoples of Africa. Let's go to German Southwest Africa, which is now known as Namibia. It's a my map of Africa again. German Southwest Africa is right down here. Let me get you a better map. So, yeah, down in here. Here's the German holdings. This is the one down here. Um, as you know from your knowledge of geography, this area is relatively dry. Um, of course, they're just grabbing this because they want a few square kilometers of some area. But how on earth do you have the opportunity to make use of the area for economic purposes? Oh, my God. Uh, that's very challenging. The local people are herders. They herd cattle. And you move around so you have a pretty good opportunity to follow the water sources and to follow the grasses. When the Germans come in, well, what are you going to do? There's no mineral resources they were able to find. So the Germans come in and decided that they will just simply start using cattle. They'll bring in cattle that's owned by Germans and controlled by that. Well, the local people don't like this very much. And then you end up with the possibility of having a lot of friction. I'm going to break off my story in the middle for right now, because I don't think I can accomplish much anything in the next couple of minutes. So I will come back and revisit this again. But right now, I want to remind you that this is the first lecture. Uh, this would be probably, let me look at the calendar, this is a lecture I would normally have given on, on the morning of the 24th. So I give you, so I uh, ask you to probably watch that anytime you want. And I will try to record another lecture that I would have given you on March the 26th. Um, in the meantime, if the weather turns out good for you, and I will speak to you at another time. Kyle. I stopped it, didn't I? Okay, you. No, press stop. That's it.